Today I'm going to talk about AC waveforms. So in the previous video, we showed how the time domain works and how we can plot something like, oh, we used the minute hand of a clock and showed that if we had the degrees, I'll just put a little circle there, compared to time, that as that hand goes around to 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270, and 360 back to zero, we would see it go to, over time, go 90 degrees, 180, 270, 360, zero, and then we'd zero that back out. And each cycle of the hand, as we plot that angle over time, we got this interesting shape here that we call a wave because it's really just measuring angle over time. I mean, there's nothing wavy here that, that would look like this. But as we measure the angle over time, we get this straight line that goes up at well, whatever angle it does, and then drops back down because we go back to zero, just simply because we're not continuing on, but saying, let's start it over again. And we get this repeated form, which looks kind of like a wave. So we call it a wave. It's not like a wave on an ocean. That's something physical that you can look at and see and watch, but it's just the way the voltage changes over time in what we call the time domain. So let's take a look at some other wave shapes we might get. And this one, of course, as I said before, is called a sawtooth wave because it looks like the teeth of a saw. Now let's take a look at what happens with one of the models I used for what alternating current is, and that's the rotating battery. So here's a battery, and we put that on a stick so we can spin it around. So here's the positive, there's the negative, and from your point of view, that goes round and round and round. And we put some contacts here and here so that sometimes it's positive to negative, but that battery rotates around and now it becomes positive to negative the other way. So if we look at the voltage, it's positive to negative and then it's negative to positive. And if we look at that in the time domain, let's go ahead and draw our graph here. Once again, time, and now it's going to be some voltage. So we're going to measure, let's just look at, you know, positive to negative. So sometimes the positive side is positive, and then it flips to negative, and then it flips back to positive, and then it flips back to negative, then it flips back to positive. Well, now we don't get that ramping up and then drop. We get a flat bottom, flat top, and this um, steep sides. This could also be perhaps a voltage that is, let's just put a couple of voltages here. How about uh, plus 10 volts and minus 10 volts. So it's plus 10, suddenly minus 10, suddenly plus 10, suddenly minus 10. Throw some DC in there. How about zero volts and plus 10 volts, 10 volts, zero volts, 10 volts, zero volts. And so as time goes by, we get these flat tops and steep sides. Sort of looks square, doesn't it? We call that a square wave. Now let's look at what comes out of the wall. I have here a compact disc. Some of you old timers may actually know what this is, but it's round and I can use it as an example of what I want to show you. So let's say this has a spot right here. In fact, why don't we put a little spot right there? I have a pin in my hand to put a spot right there. And we can watch, go round and round. As I spin this disc, what happens? The spot goes round and round as I spin this disc. Now what's going to happen if I turn this sideways to you? Well, now as I spin it, we see the spot go up and down and up and down. And now let's move the disc across your line of sight. You really won't be able to see this, but you have to use your imagination. As this turns around, you can watch my finger, that is going to make kind of a spiral. And the shape is going to look very much, let's get rid of our square wave here. The wave is going to look, let's put our minus 10 volts there because we can. It's going to be something that looks sort of like that. Does that look familiar from our last lecture? It's a sine wave. Huh? So that sine wave is very closely related to a circle. As time goes by, as that circle goes by, a spot on that disk would go along and make a sine wave in the graph that if we're kind of graphing it as we go along, we're graphing the voltage as we go along. And so this is what we would see coming out of the wall is the sine wave. So it's very closely related to a circle. So measuring it in degrees saying, well, this is 90 degrees, 180, 270, 360, and zero, and repeats itself is very appropriate for a sine wave. 
And also, it's called a sine wave because we can predict the voltage at any point by knowing our peak voltage and how far along we are, how many degrees we are along between 0, 90, 180, 270, 360. We can actually predict that voltage with the sine trigonometric function. So we call this a sine wave. So let's use that sine wave to show how we measure alternating current. So there's one cycle of our sine wave. We've already determined that that is going to be 360 degrees because using degrees is a nice convenient way to measure something that repeats. Now the time it takes to complete these 360 degrees is called the period. So here in America that period of what comes out of the wall or off the mains would be 16.6 milliseconds. Most of the world that would be 20 milliseconds. So I'm going to try to stay stay away from the North American standard. That's kind of stuck in my head, but I'll try to use the more broad standard of 20 milliseconds. So 50 times every second would give us 20 milliseconds for the period. So the frequency is how many times this happens per second. The period is how long it takes to do one complete cycle. So one complete cycle in 20 milliseconds would be 50 cycles in one second. Now I'm going to put a zero line here. There's our zero volts. Now, I could put this at some other voltage, but we'll leave it at zero at this time to avoid any confusion. Now, I'm going to stay in North America because I don't want to try to do the math in my head. So, in North America, this is going to peak at about 170 volts. So, that comes here and peaks and then starts going back down at 170 volts. And then, after another quarter cycle or 10 milliseconds in most of the world, that's going to go to zero again, and then it's going to go to the minus side, so it's going to be minus 170 volts. So in America, we go to 170 and down to minus 170. About that in just a moment. But anyway, this is the peak, right? I already said that. It peaks at 170 volts, so we'll call that voltage from zero, from the midpoint to the peak, as our peak voltage. Now, if we have some DC offset, it's going to move that, so this could be, what if this was 10 volts here? We had some DC offset in it. Uh, if this was 10 volts, that would be 180, and that would be minus 160. So it just simply moves it, but we still have the same peak voltage of 170 volts from the middle. So the distance from the middle to the peak voltage is called the peak voltage. But we also have the other peak voltage, which is the same thing, it's still the peak voltage. And we measure our peak voltage as an absolute, in other words, no sign. So this has a peak voltage of 170 volts. So it has 170 volts peak. And if we do have some offset in there, once again, if this is 10 volts, it peaks at 170. 10 plus 170 is 180. Peaks the other way. 10 minus 170 is 160. So our peak voltage is still 170. We do not have a sign. It's an absolute. So that's 170 volts peak. But we also have the voltage from this peak to the other peak, which is useful, especially if we're measuring on oscilloscopes. It's a little more convenient than some other ways. And so we have what we call the peak to peak voltage, which would be 340 volts. hope I got that right. Peak to peak. So from this voltage, to that voltage is 340 volts. And so we have our peak voltage and our peak to peak voltage. And then finally, where does that 120 volts come from? If we take a bunch of voltage measurements along here and take the square root of all those voltages, then we take the average of those, or the mean, and then we square that, we get the root mean square voltage, which in this case comes out to 120 volts. It also turns out that a DC voltage of 120 volts carries the same amount of energy. So if I put this across a particular resistor, I'm not going to do the math right now, but a particular resistor, let's say we get 10 watts across that resistor, I'm going to also get 10 watts if I put 120 volts DC across here. So this 170 volts down to minus 170 volts, 340 volts peak to peak has the same energy as 120 volts DC, which is also the RMS voltage. So this is 120 volts RMS, or we might say that as 120 volts AC. So if we say AC, we mean RMS, unless we qualify that by saying it's peak to peak 
or peak. So what have we done here so far? We have a wave that we have decided is 360 degrees because that's a convenient way to measure where we are in the wave. The time it takes to complete one cycle is called the period. The number of cycles we have per second is called the frequency. So a period of 20 milliseconds has a frequency of 50 times per second. So 50 cycles per second or 50 hertz has a period of 20 milliseconds. One more thing we have before I move on is what if we have a wave that's the same voltage, the same frequency, but just happens to reach these voltages at a different time. So let's say here's time zero and let's say uh, five milliseconds later, the other wave is at zero. And so when it reaches the peak, it's five milliseconds later. And let's say it reaches its zero point. Well, this one reaches the zero point here at, okay, there's five milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, 15 milliseconds. So this one reaches zero at 10 milliseconds. This one reaches zero at 15 milliseconds. And finally, this one does a complete cycle in 20 milliseconds. And the other one is going to be 25 milliseconds because it's five milliseconds late. So it's the same frequency, the same voltage, just at a different time. We call this a phase difference. So the phase would be how we compare one wave's timing to another wave's timing. So this wave has one timing and this one is five milliseconds later than the first one. But how does it line up? Notice that the peaks are 90 degrees apart and these are also 90 degrees apart. So this particular wave is 90 degrees out of phase with the other wave. So we take the difference between two waves and how they line up with each other in time, and that is the phase difference or the phase angle. So this has a phase difference of 90 degrees. When we deliver power across the power grid, we actually deliver the power on three different wires. So here's a tower and it has three wires hanging from it. There's wire number one, wire number two, wire number three, and hope you can follow that drawing. And the voltage on this wire would be, like there's that one. The next one, the voltage is a little later. And the next one, it's even later. And it's such that, eh, didn't do a bad drawing here. They are 120 degrees apart each peak. And it keeps repeating, so it's a nice even number. The reason we do that is two reasons. One, because of some stuff I'll explain down the road when I talk about power distribution, the phases and the voltages all line up, everything being equal, such that we can actually deliver the same amount of power with three wires that would take four wires. So it saves on infrastructure. And the other is that we always have some power in here. When this one's reaching zero, so let's draw a zero line in here. When this one reaches zero volts and is not delivering any energy, this one is coming up to its peak. And I don't have this drawn just right, but it's such that at any point in time, the voltages of all these uh, equal out so that we have an even amount of energy between the three phases. And that's great for industrial motors because they never have any point where there's no power being delivered to them. So it's, uh, efficient for infrastructure because it takes less wire because of the mathematical trick I'll show you later on and because we always have some energy in there and it's great for three phase industrial motors. Now let's look at some other wave shapes. We already looked at a sawtooth wave because that's what we got when we looked at the angle of a clock in the time domain. So we had this angle changes, 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 back to zero, changes, 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 back to zero. Not going to say much more about this just yet because I want to talk about a square wave next. So there's the sawtooth wave, which we looked at, and we also looked at a square wave. So a square wave looks like this. Of course, voltage changes abruptly, stays flat, changes abruptly, and stays the same, changes abruptly, stays the same. And so we get this, what we call a square wave, because we get the flat top and the steep sides from the abrupt change, and the voltage staying steady, changes stay steady. But there's more than meets the eye. In fact, let me ask you a question. Which is simpler, the sine wave? Or the square wave. I already said this is pretty complicated by saying that I can predict what voltage this is at any point in the wave by a trigonometric function, but this one is just one voltage to other voltage, one voltage to other voltage. So this one's simpler, isn't it? Actually, 
This is the simplest wave. This has only one constituent, one single sine wave. If we take some filters, which are uh, electronic components that can uh, let one frequency through but not others, and we put those filters on here, we find out that this wave is actually much more complicated because if this say, let's say it's one cycle per second, just because we can. Okay, there's one cycle, a very slow square wave of one second. But we'll find, if we filter it, we find that this has a sine wave that is at one cycle per second. Let's see if I can draw this here. There's a sine wave at one cycle per second. There's also another sine wave at three cycles per second, a little smaller. Let's see if I can draw this. Ah, not too bad. And notice it's in phase because it's going the same direction, same direction, same direction. And we find there's another one at seven cycles per second. Probably can't draw this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ah, close enough. And there's another one at nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It has all these sine waves in it. Notice what I have here is at the fundamental, which is, we'll call that one, at the third harmonic, three, the three times the frequency, at the fifth harmonic, they get one, three, five. Oh, I put the seven in there. I forgot the five. So it's one, three, five, seven, nine. Missed the five. That's referring to the one, two, three, four, five. There we go. So the fundamental, the third harmonic, the fifth harmonic, the seventh harmonic, and the ninth harmonic. And that square wave contains all of those different frequencies. In fact, they keep on going, 9, 11, 13, but they get smaller and smaller. By the time we get to about 9, there's just there's hardly any energy there. So how does that create a square wave? Well, let's see if we can figure that out. Here's our fundamental sine wave. Now I'm going to add the third harmonic. Well, that's, let's see if I can draw this in here. Let's see, we go... One, two, three. Not too bad. Okay, notice that here we take the two voltages and they are both positive. If we call that our zero, they're both positive, so they're adding together. So our resultant is actually more voltage. So it's going to kind of push the side up. Here it goes negative, so it's going to pull the top down. And here it's the same exact thing. It's going to push this side up, pull the top down, push the side up push the side up, pull the top down, push the side up. So we combine the fundamental and the third harmonic and we get something that looks sort of like, well, even with just those, I'm starting to see it's already looking a little squarish. We add the fifth harmonic and it steepens it even more. And add the seventh harmonic, it steepens it even more. And add the ninth harmonic. So the more harmonics we add, the more odd harmonics we add in phase, the steeper the sides get and the flatter the top gets. So that square wave contains the fundamental wave. So if it's one cycle per second, it contains a sine wave that's one cycle per second, plus all of the odd harmonics in phase and at diminishing uh, strength for each uh, harmonic. So a square wave is actually fairly complicated, but we make it very simply. We can just do it by flipping a switch on and off or have an oscillator that just turns something on and off. We get a square wave, but yet by its nature has all those harmonics. I have a uh, video that's linked in uh, the description here and you can see in the lesson that's linked below that shows a what's called a Fourier synthesizer that builds up a square wave by adding all of the sine waves together. Uh, there used to be an app on the internet that you could go to and do this but it's gone now so I just have to show you the video. Okay let's break away from my lecture here for a moment because I found a online synthesizer that we can actually play with. You can find this at the uh, URL right here mjtruiz.com slash ped slash Fourier, F-U-R, F-O-U-R-I-E-R. And here is a nice uh, oscilloscope display of our wave shape, and we can play with the different sine waves we're putting in. And so right now I have a 400 hertz wave uh, displayed on the screen. There we have 400 hertz, and it's showing just the fundamental, meaning we're showing the 400 hertz wave. Let's look at the harmonics. So let's pull out the fundamental to zero. Now we're going to add the second harmonic, which is twice the fundamental frequency, or in this case, 800 hertz. And so there's 800 hertz. The third harmonic will be three times that frequency, or that will be a 1200 hertz. Here's four times the frequency, the fourth harmonic, or 1600 hertz. And we can go all the way up to the 16th harmonic here. And that's so 
high frequency I can't even hear it so pull that down and so now we can play with these waves and show that we can make many wave shapes by just adding sine waves together so here is the fundamental sine wave uh, what we have on the screen here of course is the voltage is going up the voltage is going down the voltage is going up the voltage is going down following this particular pattern and if we send that to a speaker so we move the air to the same pattern we get actual sound waves rather than just voltages plotted on a screen and we get a sound that we hear what is a sine wave and you can hear that in the background so there's the fundamental now what i'm going to do is add the third harmonic in phase so there's the fundamental notice it goes up and then down and up and down and the third harmonics doing the same thing up then down then up then down so let's go and add the fundamental here comes the third harmonic now watch what happens the sides get steeper and the top comes down as we add third harmonic now let's add some fifth harmonic now watch the sides get even steeper and the top gets even flatter if you will and it's not quite flat but we'll see as we add more and more harmonics it tends to appear flatter and flatter there's the seventh harmonic here comes the ninth harmonic i'm going to pull a little bit of seventh out a little bit of fifth out just trying to even things out a little bit here there we go that's it takes a little work to do this by hand but i'm going to do my best now let's add some 11th harmonic just a little bit pull out some 9th pull out a little bit of 7th a little bit of 5th just trying to even things out not doing too awfully bad now let's add a little 13th harmonic just want to add just a tiny bit play with the 11th play with the 9th and the 7th and notice as I add each odd harmonic, here goes the 15th, the last odd harmonic we can add. Hardly added any of that, but look what we have, a nice steep side. It's a little flat-ish here, but uh, not perfect. Let's go ahead and hit the square button here. This will create a square wave uh, in the generator itself while well, using the Fourier synthesis. And you can see it created a little better square wave than I did. Now there's another synthesizer online you might like even better. Let's switch over to that. That is just falstead.com slash Fourier and here this one's making a square wave and we can see it's a much better square wave it has some uh, uh, noise at the leading and trailing edge but you can see how nice and square it is and there it is the fundamental third harmonic and you can see the harmonics as I hover over them third harmonic fifth harmonic seventh ninth eleventh as we go down the scale here so you might like this one better. I'm not using this one mainly because the sound is really terrible, uh, at least on my computer. So I'm using the other one. Also, it looks a little cleaner. So let's go back to this one here. And let's go back to our sine wave. Now let's start adding even harmonics. Actually, not even harmonics, but all of the harmonics. Let's go, there's the second harmonic. Look what's happening. Watch it lean to the left. Add the third harmonic. Kind of straightens that out a little bit add the fourth harmonic and the fifth boy I'm not going to do much better than that by hand look at that look at that nice sawtooth wave there and it's just all of the harmonics added in phase now watch what happens if I reverse the phase of everything I'm going to go ahead and reverse the phase but the first uh, harm but the fundamental uh, also known as the first harmonic 180 degrees out of phase looks kind of weird there but let's just do it to every one of them just flipping every one of them over and look how we're getting back to a sawtooth but now it's in the opposite direction not a half bad sawtooth wave let's see how it makes its own sawtooth wave well, it looks a little different it's using everything 180 degrees out and you see it has more of the harmonics in there and so but it creates a well I don't know which one is better this one or the one I had but there you have a sawtooth wave created by simply adding sine waves together now what I'm going to do is go back to the sine wave and I'm going to add odd harmonics but each other one I'm going to put 180 degrees out of phase so here is the third harmonic 180 degrees out of phase let's add that in 
Now the fifth harmonic we'll leave the same. Put a little fifth harmonic in here. A little, little third out, a little fifth out. Now we're going to put the seventh harmonic 180 degrees out of phase and add a little bit of it there. Ninth harmonic. Let's pull a little seventh out. Try to even things out a bit. Not too bad. And the eleventh harmonic we're going to put 180 degrees out of phase. I don't think I'm going to do much better, but look what I did. I now have a triangle wave. Let's go ahead and hit the triangle wave button here. And did a lot cleaner. Notice it puts every other odd harmonic 180 degrees out of phase and adds just the right amount and made a pretty clean triangle wave. So there you can see using this Fourier synthesizer that we can create these different wave shapes out of sine waves. So a square wave contains the fundamental plus all of the odd harmonics in phase. A sawtooth wave contains all of the harmonics. Then a triangle wave contains all of the odd harmonics every other odd harmonic being flipped in phase. So there is what you can do with a Fourier synthesizer. Every waveform, no matter how complicated it is, if it's a repeating waveform, is going to be made up of multiple sine waves of different harmonics. The fact that our waves that are not sine waves have multiple frequencies in them has some consequences when we go through circuits that cannot pass all of the frequencies in that wave. So here's a square wave, which is made up of many, many frequencies, let's go through a high pass filter or a circuit that passes high frequencies better than low frequencies. What we're going to do is we're going to lose the trailing edge of this and our output is going to look more like that. So notice our wave shape got severely distorted because all of the frequencies didn't go through. And if we send that through a low pass filter, which would turn that like that, or any circuit that passes low frequencies better than high frequencies, we're going to lose the leading edge and we're going to end up with something that looks more like that. So this is rather severe distortion, but it shows what happens if we lose low frequencies and then what happens if we lose high frequencies. And this is important, uh, for example, music, the, what gives your different instruments their sound is mainly in the higher frequencies. And so your instruments won't sound right in fact, some instruments, uh, like percussion instruments, completely disappear because they have mostly high frequencies. Uh, one thing I used to use to test a audio system was some music with some castanets in it. And if I couldn't hear the castanets, I knew that it was not passing the high frequencies. And when it comes to voice, the parts of our uh, speech that makes our speech intelligible is in the higher frequencies. So if we have a circuit that doesn't pass those high frequencies, we're going to lose that definition and uh, it sounds like people are mumbling. In fact, people who are losing their hearing tend to lose their higher frequencies first and will start saying, why are you mumbling? You know, it's because they're losing their higher frequency hearing and they can't hear what you are saying. So uh, the high frequencies are important to definition of sound. But once again, if you look at wave shapes, this can be very useful with an oscilloscope. If you send a square wave, and you get that, you know that you're losing your low frequencies. If you see that, you know you're losing your high frequencies. So those are our AC wave shapes and what they mean and what we need to know about them. And the uh, next thing we'll get into is how to measure these. If you found this video useful and informative, please give me a thumbs up down below. It really helps the channel. And subscribe because that not only informs you when I put new videos up, but it really helps the channel also. And a big thank you to my patrons at Patreon. I could not make these videos without your support. If you want to help me put these videos online and keep real vocational education free at vocademy.net, you can go to Patreon slash join slash vocademy and pledge your support. And again, a big thank you to my patrons who make this possible and a big thank you to everyone for watching.